everyone, and welcome to Behind the Curtain, an interview series where I talk with theater professionals about how they got to where they are today and how you can too. I'm Lauren Hillman with Theatrics Youth Theater Society, and today I'm interviewing Nathan Kelly. Hi, Nathan. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Uh, so tell us what you do in the theater industry. What's your job? Uh, lately, I'm an acting teacher with after school and weekend programs and lights up, as well as a lighting and sound theater technician at four or five different venues around the city. Wow, and you've, like everyone I've talked to, you seem to have multiple jobs in the industry. That right? I was always told it was that way in the arts, and it seems to be true. So, uh, when you're teaching, what are some of the words of wisdom that you would love to pass on to kids? It's important to listen, even to each other, and we know it's hard, but keep trying. Sometimes when you get a class of 11 or 14 just excellent listeners, you, you really are able to see some magic come together. And it, It'll be quite fun. How did you get your start in the theater? Let's go there. I remember in kindergarten at Lord Baden Powell Elementary School, I played uh, a lima bean. And uh, the following year, I played a rapping attorney who was a rat. Everyone gave me all these positive accolades after that. They're like, you were so good. And I was like, I want to chase this feeling forever. This is the best. And so you joined theatrics after. Yeah, my first play was um, The Quest for the Holy Grail. Um, I, I played the stone of the sword in the stone. Uh, I played, you know, young Lancelot and young Galahad, because we had multiple generations of every tale out there, something for all ages. So you've done a lot of shows with theatrics over the years, haven't you? Yeah, probably 10 or so. It's been a lot of good memories between summer shows and then shows that took us throughout the year. Is there a specific theatrics memory from your childhood that um, stands out to you? Yeah, there's uh, one from the Tales of the Arabian Nights, um, a play in which, at the time, I believe I had set a record for playing eight parts in one act. And uh, four of those parts were in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back scenes. And uh, in one of them, I was uh, a camel, and one of them, I was a fisherman's husband, and my mom would wait side stage and we would take off one costume and flip me around and throw me back on stage for the next scene. And I remember one day I just, I, I took off my merchant costume and I was flying off and I throw the camel hump on and I put the head on and I turn to my right and I see the fisherman's wife. And I realize, oh no, the next scene I'm the fisherman. Uh, and we had a song together with myself and Alyssa Hanson Smith. And I just said, like, you do it. And uh, she covered for me while I was just uh, side stage in the wrong costume. I guess you couldn't come out and sing it as a camel, could you? Just, we couldn't make it make sense story wise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, those things happen in the theater. That's part of the fun. And I love that those are the memories that we keep at the end. So let's talk about what you did afterwards. When you decided that you wanted to go into theater as a profession, what did you do? I first went to an active school right out of high school and the timing in the school wasn't right. So I transferred into the tech program because I knew I wanted to do something in and around the industry. And I knew I liked that avenue and I thought maybe that would make me slightly more employable while I figure other things out. I was really glad to have that skill. And then once you have that skill, you start turning it into a career very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you sort of realize, well, I put myself on this career path. Is this the career path that I would like to be on? I just continued to perform because it was always my first love, but it, it's not always easy to support yourself that way. So you find things like acting teaching or entering as many different writing contests as you can or experimenting with stand-up comedy or trying to do sketch comedy at a different acting school years later with school creatives. And it's all about just keeping the art alive in, in some way, I think. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You write, you do the technical side, uh, lighting, etc. You also do acting uh, and you also do teaching. Which of those is the easiest to find employment in? To my surprise of late teaching. Um, yeah, there's a, a good deal of appetite out there for after school and weekend programs of people who are very energetic and have a high endurance because acting teaching, while incredibly rewarding, is incredibly tiring. It's funny, I compare <laughs> four hours of acting teaching to 10 hours of labor, and they're about equally tiring in entirely different ways. Yeah, you know that I'll agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I understand though why you decided you might want to go a little more technical. Generally speaking, there are less people in tech rather than actors where everybody wants to be on stage, right? It's still competitive. It's, there's still a, a ladder to be climbed and a union job to be attained. I'm an IAC 118 member, thank goodness. Why don't you tell us about that ladder? What are some of the steps on the ladder a person would climb on that side, on the technical side of things? It depends what they'd like to accomplish. If they'd like to be a designer, they might want to start with a, two years of college. They may want to go to a university and just start with a design degree. Uh, UBC's got a great program. Um, they also may want to be a carpenter. You know, I would recommend getting into the shop as many hours as they can trying to work maybe uh, the opportunities through BAMP to work on the job are always something that young technicians are quite fond of. Uh, yeah, if you want to work with lighting equipment, try and get yourself in, at, like the K-Meek Center was a great one coming up for me as, as a place where young lighting crew just can cut their teeth as one of the many local venues that are so willing to try and take on somebody new. Cool. And what about it for people who don't know where they want to land? Do you have any tips for them? Try stuff. There's a company that's called Rig It, where you can be one of 2,000 people who pushes a box backstage. These are the people who like build all of your local concert shows. And they're not always the most glamorous job, but they give you a really nice look of everything that this industry has to offer. Do you want to be a video person? Do you want to be a speaker's person? Do you want to be a head lighting? I mean, do you want to be the person who sits in the loading dock and helps direct where these boxes get pushed? It's a very important job also. Um, I want to talk now about some of the comedy stuff that you do, um, because that is still performing, but it's not exactly the same as doing theater. So what are some of the differences in terms of what you found in the industry? I came from an improv background, as lots of theatrics, especially back in the day. Mm -hmm wrote their plays through performative improvs that were repeated and then formed into scripts. Yeah, so we still that, do that. Yeah, great. It's a, it's a time-honored tradition. And, and uh, so that, that gave me that skill set of how kids in the hall even always wrote their sketches or repeated improvs. They just find little eggs of comedy and try and repeat them and try and dwell those out. Um, and so improv is a very reciprocal and giving world. Like, in order for you and I to improvise well together, we have to be on the same team. We have to be trying to make each other look good and pushing each other up because that's what the audience wants for us to succeed. And it's so much about teamwork and community. And the first time I transferred over into that stand-up comedy world, you really feel how alone you are. And then in improv, you can hide not only behind your co-star, but also behind your character. I'm playing this crotchety old man or this young woman who's, you know, on her cell phone. I can be this character, but when I am Nate Kelly and I am telling you jokes and you do or don't laugh, you're making a decision on how you feel about me personally, not the character I'm playing. So by the same token, when it goes well, it feels way better. It's this, you really think I'm funny, not just me and my co-stars. And it's, uh, it's, it's a selfish glory that feels fantastic, but is also scarier. I agree. I was actually just telling my husband yesterday that the most scared and the most stage fright I've ever had in my life has not been from performing in theater. It's been when I've had to give speeches as myself in front of a big group of people. All right, let's talk now about the writing that you do. As you said, you've entered some writing contests. So first of all, what do you write? Most recently, I've been writing things that look like screenplays. Yeah, last year I was the top 12 finalist for the Crazy Eights, which is a local like 10 to 12 page short film contest. Um, yeah, uh, more recently, there's a, there's a lot of local contests that have sprung up, especially in these times of quarantine. Uh, the new NYCC at Midnight contest has run annually, and it's a, a great place for young people who are writing short films who may not know how to get them produced to be given an opportunity, and that's three prompts, as in something about hoarding that's a crime caper that has a dog groomer in it. You have 10 days, go. Just to be given those deadlines and that impetus, it, it can really help create the skill set of what it needs to, to be a writer with a deadline who's creating content. Ooh, 
you say some of the people don't know how to get their stuff produced. Have you produced any of the screenplays that you have written or have any of them been produced by someone else? Uh, I have produced some of the uh, short sketch film with lots of my friends and like local online YouTube videos. And YouTube is such an amazing resource because yes. you can create a short web series of something with a, a six episode arc. And then to do like the editing yourself and, and try to promote it amongst your friends, maybe creating a, a Twitter page for your little piece of short film. Yeah. And it's good to practice all those skills because as you continue to be in the arts, if you want to continue, you're going to have to develop each of those skills. So sometimes it's, be, it's good to do them not just for a heavily produced show, but for something that's maybe smaller and a labor of love to remind yourself what you're doing it for, why you're doing it, and what you're capable of. Would you tell me a little about your process with writing? I've tried the let ideas flow technique. It, it's a bit more fun. It's very therapeutic. It's, it's a great thought exercise, and I do recommend people do it and just give something a try. But once you've written a couple of those, you realize that maybe the plot isn't progressing in the ideal way. And that the reason there are so many books on how to progress characters and plot is because it's kind of hard. Of late, I'm trying to write with more structure because I think that's what my writing has been missing. And I'm trying to guess. Uh, and also because, you know, I've, you don't want all your characters to sound like you. It sounds like you have a lot of self-awareness about what your writing is and not just your writing probably but also your other skills your acting your comedy etc you have to be really self-aware and know where your strengths and weaknesses are so that you can work on them is that right it's a theory you know there's a chance i'm wrong um but uh yeah that's that's my best guess so far <laughs> thank you so much nathan it was really great having you here today and thanks everyone for watching Behind the Curtain. It's been a pleasure.